Well, I'm available to start at right tackle. You can't see when I pull this on. Right. Well, there's not an even playing field. There's never been an even playing field. There never will be an even playing field. But... What shampoo do you use on your hair? You don't need to be Superman to play in this offense. You're listening to The Red Zone. Welcome, Badgers fans. It's another episode of The Red Zone. We are here to do our mailbag podcast this week. I already got some questions from you guys that I'm going to answer here, so I'll go ahead and get right into it. First, we have David Sutton at at WhiskeyLover54. He asks, does Jonathan Taylor have small hands? I was surprised, not surprised, to see him fumble. How has he worked on this eyesore to his game in the offseason? That's a good question, David. I I really don't know if Jonathan does have small hands or not. Uh, You know, they don't stand out as being really huge, I guess, but I haven't really noticed one way or the other particularly. You know, that's, I'm not really sure why he's, you know, how, why he hasn't been able to kind of get over this. You know, it is something he emphasized in the, uh, throughout the offseason. You know, there, there are times, even last year too, he would, kind of, you know, you know, walk around everywhere with a football in his hand and just get, get more used to holding on to the football. Um, they've been doing other, I think, I think they've been doing some other drills to try to, um, you know, try to make sure he can, you know, hold on to the ball further and just, you know, constant reminders to, uh, to kind of keep, you know, the, uh, keep the ball tight to his body and, and not allow that to happen. You know, I guess it's easier said than done. And it, and it gets to something that he's still, still working on. I, I guess it's, I, I think it's really kind of concerning that, it seemed like that was that ball was popped out quite easily on 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 Friday against Western Kentucky. It's not like somebody got a huge hit to him and got it, got their head right on the ball or or had a you know really hard punch that just just was able to knock it out. Someone just kind of came from behind and, and poked it free, and he just uh, he just completely lost it. So it's definitely something to keep an eye on to see if he's able to 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 do better in that area this season. You know, it, it doesn't look great so far. You know, this this whole off season we were. We were kind of wondering if he had fixed this problem because you know we, we there's not really much contact during the off season that we see you know they don't go live that often and especially when the media is there um and just especially with the first team you know Taylor's Taylor's not getting tackled in practice so I guess that's that's something that we weren't really sure if he had if he had fixed or not because we hadn't really seen him go go live in practice uh, throughout the entire off season so now that he fumbled in the first game against Western Kentucky. Obviously, it looks like that's still a little bit of an issue. So we'll have to see if he's able to, to kind of turn the, you know, right the ship on that one. So I guess time will tell whether, whether that that you know fumble against Western Kentucky is a continuation from last year, or if it's just, uh, just just the, just happened to happen in the first game of the season, and he's he's actually you know on his way to cleaning it up. Let's see a couple of questions from Zach the Great at one Sween. His first one was. Uh, was the hoodie DB group a two-year thing, or were they banned from wearing them? Zach, I, I don't, I haven't heard anything about them being banned from from wearing the hoodies. Now, I haven't, I haven't specifically asked about that either. You know, the two main guys that were doing it last year, if I remember correctly, were were Nelson and, and Tendall, and they were both gone. So, you know, there's definitely a chance that, you know, that 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 that's just it's just kind of expired and and the guys that were doing it are just, just not with the program anymore. You know, all these cornerbacks that we're seeing this season are guys, especially, you know, with Dante Kerry Williams gone now are guys that haven't really played it at all, really. So I guess I just don't, I guess I don't know if they're just preferences not to wear a hoodie and, and it's died out. I, you know, I haven't heard anything about them being banned, but uh, maybe I'll have to ask that question. Let's see. A second question is, do you think the Badgers are saving gadget plays for Aaron Crookshank? until Big Ten play because wow did he do, he look at different speed out there. Yeah, Crookshank did kind of pop on that 30 yard kickoff return he got once Kendra Pryor went out with cramps and you know he, he that one deep ball near the end it looked like he beat his man but it just, just the ball didn't quite get there. You know, I I think he is I mean obviously he's you know we've seen it all off season. Uh this guy is 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 a really talented player and is a really athletic guy. You know, I think he doesn't have a bigger role in the offense right now, you know, partially because he's still kind of getting a grasp of the playbook, still doesn't have quite everything down. Now, I, I think it's been the plan for a long time to use him in certain packages. You know, we did see him take a jet sweep later in the game on Friday night against Western Kentucky. So I think he is going to do more of that. I, I think you might be right, though. I think there might be some things with him where 
you know, there's there's just no not really a reason for us to pull it out against Western Kentucky when we're you know, when they're winning you know, when they win the game by thirty one points. So I think maybe when, when we get to Big Ten play and, and Crookshank has got his feet wet a little bit and, and has a few games under his belt, uh maybe his role will start to increase and you might see a little bit more of those gadget plays that uh that, that you're looking for. Let's see, the next one is from David Jurgensen at DC Jurgensen. He asks, what's the relationship between you and other Badger media personalities, Jesse Temple, Zach Heilpern, etc.? Is it a rivalry or more of a camaraderie? I, I'd say it's definitely more of a camaraderie. You know, I'm, I'm friends with a lot of those guys, and including Jesse and Zach, and I've, you know, I've had a lot of those guys on this podcast for, for you guys that, that listen, uh, you know, weekly or normally. So yeah, I think it's I think you know I'm friends with a lot of those guys, and I think it's it's definitely more of a camaraderie now. I mean, you know, some guys on the beat you you grow closer to than others, but I, I think you know I don't think I have a you know rivalry with with anybody on the beat or anything like that. So you know, I think it's I think it's a really um, I think it's a really good work environment on the beat with with these other beat writers. I think we you know typically. Um, help each other out if needed. And it's, uh, you know, I, I think we're all pretty much friends. So I think it's, you know, I, I really enjoy covering this team, not only because Wisconsin is a, you know, uh, a good team to cover They're you know, they're, you know, pretty media friendly and, you know, it's, uh, it's a good team, which is always fun to cover. But, you know, I think the other guys that are on the beat with me, it's, it's fun to, it's fun to cover the team with those guys as well. Let's see, John, Sour at JS Hour 31. He asks, any idea how close Bryson Williams and Isaiah Mullins are to contributing on the defensive line? You know, John, that's that's a tough question. You know, Bryson Williams actually did play a, a little bit, uh, maybe the second to last drive, maybe. I, I think he, you know, he did get in there against Western Kentucky uh, very briefly. So they're at least, I think they are going to use him this year. He is the number two nose tackle. So if anything were to happen to Olivia Sangapolo, I think you would definitely see him play a really big role. And and I think until then, he'll probably play here and there. Isaiah Mullins is a little bit further away from playing, I think. You know, he's a guy that we kind of came into fall camp thinking that he might have a chance. He seemed like he was physically ready. And even back in the spring, when before Mullins had gotten on campus, some of the Badgers coaches w- were saying, you know, we, we're going to probably throw this guy in there and give him a chance as far as reps in practice. You know, he's going to get some reps in practice and we're going to see what he's got. So, you know, he didn't end up taking really much, much no first team reps in, in, in fall camp and, and really not, not really any second team reps either. So it looks like he's a little further away than maybe we thought or, or the coaches thought he would be when he, when he first arrived. And uh, so I, we'll see though. I think we might see Mullins at some point, you know, he, he can play four games in red shirt still. I, I think he definitely is a red shirt guy, but that doesn't mean he might not play, you know, a couple games later in the year if he's if he's more ready, um, you know, in, in a month or two or in a couple months. So I, I think maybe there's a chance you end up seeing Mullins. Maybe you don't see him at all. But I think Bryson Williams will play quite, you know, will end up playing a decent amount this year and maybe not even red shirt, you know. So I, I think you're going to see Williams out there as the number two nose tackle. The interesting thing about this defensive line you know, we knew it was a little thin, and we knew they were young and inexperienced. But when you go back to that Western Kentucky game, and you 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 watch it through again, and you keep track of the defensive linemen that are in, you know, they stuck with just the the starting three defensive linemen: Olive Songapolu, Matt Henningsen, and Caden Lyles, for almost the entire first three quarters. I think David Foff got got two snaps in the third quarter, and that was that was it. I mean until the fourth quarter and the game was out of hand. Uh, Olivier Sangapolu played every snap in the first half, didn't come out until almost six minutes left in the third quarter, uh, played a ton in the nickel in nickel packages, which he hasn't done much of before this season. So and, you know, I asked Jim Leonard about that on Wednesday, and, and he said, you know, look, these these reps have got to be earned. Uh, you know, these we're not just going to throw somebody out there just because – you know, we're, we're lacking in depth. We're just, you know, these guys, you know, these starters are going to have to be workhorses for us, uh, you know, and, and tell some of these more, you know, other inexperienced guys show us that they're ready for reps and that they can, they can do a job out there. So that, that I thought that was really interesting that he said that, you know, so I, I think behind the starting three or, you know, Isaiah Laudermilk, I, I think it's really big that he's coming back this, this week, you know, able to work in over these last 
couple non-conference games before they really get into the meat of their schedule against against Iowa on the road because they, they really need him. Uh, that first game really showed it. And, and I, th- I think after Laudermilk, Henningsen, Lyles, and Songapolu, I don't think there's, you know, there are a lot of guys that, that are ready to play right now. And, and I think they are, are definitely trying their best to develop some more depth at that position, but it's, it, I think it's been a, I think it's been a tough, tough road for them to do that. So it's going to be really interesting to, to watch the defensive line rotation over these next few weeks and, and, and beyond really throughout the entire season to see if, you know, a guy like Bryce Williams gets, gets more reps than he is now. And if David Foff or Aaron Vopel at defensive end can, can, can give a couple more of these guys a little more of a breather, you know, I, I think Brechterfield would, I think you really would like to have six guys that rotate in there and, and play. Uh, but right now with, with Laudermill coming back, they clearly only have four guys they feel, you know, they feel really good about. But but I think in the case of someone like Bryce Williams as a number two nose tackle and a guy that did get in there um, a little bit there uh, later in the game, I, I think he might I think he might see his snaps increase a little bit as time goes on. I don't think they want, you know, Songo Polo to play, you know, quite as many snaps as he did. Um, on on Friday now you know he's been working on his conditioning but I don't think they want him to play the entire first half and you know a lot of milk will relieve a lot of that pressure too he can probably sub out for him a lot in, in those nickel packages but uh, you know I, th- I think the defensive line is still a work in progress and uh, you know I think Bryson Williams will still play this year Mullins I think he has you know a, a ways to go let's see Johnny Walsh at Johnny Walsh asks what improvements have been made to Camp Randall and the overall fan experience attending a game this season? You know, I haven't. The only thing I've really noticed, Johnny, is is the uh, the renaming of the student section uh, to Area Red. I think is what it's called. That actually, um, I'm not really sure if it's anything more than a name. You know, I think it's, uh, you know, I, I I actually think the student section showed up pretty well on on Friday. You know, they. they Considering the situation, considering the fact that they were playing Western Kentucky, I thought it got, you know, relatively full before the start, before kickoff. So I thought, I, I, you know, I don't know if that really had anything to do with the fact that it's, you know, area red now, um, or if, or if just, you know, it's the season opener, it's it's a night game, and it's a highly anticipated season. I will have to kind of monitor if, you know, if the student section attendance actually is, you know, does pick up throughout the throughout the season and. You know, a lot of a lot of students still did leave. You know, after after jump around in the fourth quarter, but with the game in hand, it's not really a surprise. As far as other, you know, improvements, I haven't really, you know, I haven't really noticed. Um, I didn't really notice much else in the first game. You know, it's not really something I was really looking for either. Uh, being a being a night game and and being on deadline and things. Uh, but you know, I, maybe they did a couple other things to uh, that I didn't notice that during the game that were different than last year but you know as of right now I can't really um, off the top of my head think of you know think of certain things they did for the game experience uh, that that was different than last year let's see smg at sean geary four asks in your time covering wisconsin football who is your favorite player to watch this is actually a really easy one for me it's melvin gordon uh, without a doubt he was electrifying during that 2014 season I actually started covering the team at least on a part-time basis in I think it was week three of the 2014 season so I missed the first couple games of of, of that year but um, I mean it, he was just he was just so fun to watch I mean every time he got the ball you were kind of on the edge of your seat wondering what he would do and if he would break a long gain um, or a big touchdown and um, to cover a guy that's chasing the you know, single season NCAA rushing record, which really a, a record that seemed pretty unattainable with the number that Barry Sanders put up um, in what, what, 89, I think it might've been. Um, you know, I, I think, I think he was just, you know, I, I thought he probably should have won the Heisman that year. You know, I didn't, uh, I didn't, I didn't have a vote that year. I didn't get a vote till the next season, but, but I thought, uh, I, I thought he was just fantastic. And I thought it was pretty clear that, he was going to be a success at the next level too, which is which has gone on to happen. So, I mean, for me, it's Melvin Gordon. He was, he's just a different kind of um, excitement level player than than maybe you got from Corey Clement after him or uh, Jonathan Taylor now. Um, 
And so I just, uh, yeah, if, if I, I mean, I, <laughs> if Jonathan Taylor turns out to be as exciting as, as, uh, you know, Melvin Gordon before the, you know, before the end of his career, it's going to be, going to be a real treat to watch. Let's see, we move on to Sparhawk at Sparhawk1776. He asked, do you think Deaton is going to finish his career as a tackle or switch back to guard next year? That's a good question. I think if I had to guess right now, I'd probably say he switches back to guard, but you know, that that's hard to say this early on. You know, he he's done you know really well at tackle. I think he's done better at tackle than I anticipated when he first moved there. You know, I think that he in fall camp was moving really well. Now, based on this first game, it kind of leaves a lot of question marks. You know, Deason, you know, they, he was rotating with Cole Maylan in the first half, and then he came out and didn't play in the second half at all. And, you know, he did leave in the middle of their last first half series. You know, they subbed in Van Landen for Deason in the middle of that two-minute two minute series there at the end of the half. So you have to wonder if, if maybe something was bothering Deason. I know they're still trying to limit his reps here and be smart with him coming off the surgery he had in the off season. So it's going to be interesting to see moving forward these next few games, how much he plays and how much Van Landen plays. Cause I think Van Landen looked uh, just great on, on Friday and you can read our, our film room piece that we do every week. Uh, this one on that came out on Tuesday on madison.com. Uh, the, the lead of it was, was really about how well Cole Van Landen played. And I thought he, he really showed himself well in the, in the time that he got out there. So when you're looking ahead to next year, you are going to lose, you know, two, uh, really good interior linemen and, and Michael Dieter and Bo Benshaw and, you know, Cole Van Landen will be back. I, my guess is that David Edwards will probably also leave. You know, he's a, he's a red shirt junior, but he's a guy that's probably going to have the opportunity to go to the NFL after this season. Um, so let's just say those three guys leave, uh, you know, you're left with, uh, you still have Tyler Biotich at center. You have a guy like Jason Erdman at guard still. Uh, but then you have to kind of balance, you know, where you need Dietzen as far as, you know, do you, um, do you move, maybe, do you maybe move Cole Van Landen to right tackle and play John Dietzen at, at, at left tackle? Or do you, do you, does Logan Bruss take a jump and you, you think he's ready to play right tackle? And so you leave Cole Van Landen at left tackle and move move decent to, to left guard and play Erdman to right guard. Or, you know, I think there's a lot of different options they could do. You also have the possibility of Caden Lyles coming back from defensive line to, to playing on the interior as well. So I think there's a lot of questions of, you know, um, where they're going to place guys. And, and, if, and if Lyles is going to play a factor on the offensive line next year. Um, so I, it, and also how well decent can, continues to develop as a left tackle. You know, I think that guard is maybe his more natural position. And so I think maybe in his final year he might want to he might want to go back to to guard and, and see what he can do with that position as a senior. So I, I think that there's a lot of factors in play here, and, and it's really too early to tell exactly where he'll be. We need to at least see how well he develops as a tackle and, and see if he can actually do that because you know he did look good in practice, but you know again he's played I think it might be like 27 snaps against Western Kentucky, and and it's not a whole lot to go off of. So. So we'll have to see, you know, and if the injuries continue to bother him, you know, he, he played through injury all of last season. And if I think for in his situation, it's going to be a little it's going to be more difficult for him to play through an injury, a left tackle than maybe left guard, you know, to, the athleticism needed to, to play that position, especially in pass protection. Uh, if, if he's if he's fighting, if he's battling through like he did last year at any point, then that's going to be pretty difficult for him to um to be a a really effective left tackle in that situation, I think. So, so I, it's a really good question. It's something interesting to think about, but I think we have to at least wait, you know, see how the season progresses and, and see, you know, um, kind of how he develops left tackle and then how some, you know, going into next season, how some other guys like Logan Bruss, um, develop and if, if, if Caden Lyles is, is coming back to offense or not. So that's, that's a really good question, and we're going to have to kind of, uh, like I said, right now I think if, if I had to guess and I had to make a prediction, just because he's a more natural guard, um, I, and I think that there'll be enough, you know, spots will open up enough where he can, you know, he, he's able to, to, to start at guard next season. I think that I'd have to guess that he'll move back to guard. But then again, if, if they move Lyles back over, 
that they might they might end up thinking that they need more depth at tackle and that they really need him at tackle. So that's that's a really good question and something that I think we'll see develop over uh, over the course of the year and and heading into next season. Let's see, last one here from John Hermanson at John Hermanson. He asks, what's behind the recent batch of players leaving the program? Is it a coincidence that they're all on defense or is there something else going on? Yeah, so for some background who people for people who don't know, you know, Dante Carey Williams left the program last week. I think he announced it last Wednesday night. Um, and he intends to transfer. Um, la- at some point last week, Arrington Farrar also left the program. Now, he is a, a senior who, who didn't really look like he was going to play much. At, you know, at best, I think he was the fifth outside linebacker this season. And then this year, uh, Patrick Johnson, um, or not this year, this week, uh, a couple days ago, P- Patrick Johnson left the um, left the program as well, and, and his was reported by the Journal Sentinel as uh, as personal reasons. So, I think when you ask about, you know, is this? It is strange that three people left within about a week, um, but I think these are just such different situations that I, I don't think you can say anything um, fishy or anything bad is going on here. The Ferrar situation, I mean, it was just a guy that. It was it nearing the end of his career and, and just, you know, he just wasn't going to play, you know, and I think that maybe he wanted to, you know, he's still taking classes here at UW from what I've heard and, and maybe he just wanted to focus on school. You know, I mean, maybe if he still has hope for a, for a football career, he can, you know, um, go to school. He has, I don't think he's redshirted yet, so he could, you know, finish out his degree this year, do a graduate transfer possibly. Um, to another school and, and play next year. That's, you know, I think that option is at least on the table for him. Um, but he just wasn't going to play. He was getting toward the end of the career, his career here, and he didn't look like he was going to play much. So that's pretty normal for, for guys like that to to lead the program in his case. And in Patrick Johnson's case, when, when it's personal reasons like like his, you know, you just don't, um, you just don't know what's going on with, uh, with his situation. And, you know, we saw last year, you know, Jazz PB lead the program for personal reasons as well. And uh, so I, I think it's just when I think it's just, you know, when it's a situation where, you know, a guy's going through something or some other off the field um, issue is, is holding him back, then, um, you know, we've seen that happen in the past before. And I think, you know, Jim Leonard spoke really highly of Patrick Johnson um, on and off the field on Wednesday when we talked to him. And I think his situation is just separate from all of these as well. You know, he was a guy that was going to play a big role this season. He was probably their, you know, their third safety this year, and really would have had a chance to to start for uh, be the replacement for Dakota Dixon next season. But uh, you know, I think Dante Kerry Williams is the only strange one to me. You know, he's a guy that was going to play a lot this season, and was a guy that kind of came into fall camp as the presumed number one cornerback on the team. Now he had, you know, he had been moved down to the second team, and uh, you know, Jim Leonard said earlier in fall camp that they needed to see more consistent effort from him but so so this this th- that one was a strange one and you have to wonder exactly what happened there uh but it just seemed like there was you know I, I think with these three in one week thing I I think it's just a little bit of a coincidence that that they all happen this close together because I don't think Farrar or, or Johnson um I definitely don't think they left on bad terms and I think it was uh you know what ha- you know with them leaving the program was was not something too out of the ordinary to me so I mean, you know, this on the back of what happened with Quintus Evis and Danny Davis makes it look, you know, I guess even even like more things are going on and, and more guys are, are leaving. But I, I think it's pretty coincidental uh, that, that all this is happening. Now, the Kerry Williams one, like I mentioned, is is a bit of a strange one. And, you know, it's I, I kind of wonder exactly what happened there between him and, and the team. But um, again, you know, guys transfer. um on a pretty regular basis. And, you know, that's, that's just what happens sometimes. Uh, so I, I, I know it is strange that, that you see, you know, <laughs> you wake up almost every day these last week and it seems like somebody else is leaving the program, but I don't think there's any cause for concern at all. You know, I think most, you know, like I said, Ferrar and Johnson were, were relatively normal circumstances. And I don't think that, you know, there's anything going on here at, at the program that you really need to need to worry about. All right. Thanks for all the questions, guys. I really appreciate it. Uh, That's going to do it for this week. Make sure you follow me on Twitter at Jason underscore Galloway. We are going to do a Twitter live chat 
after Saturday's New Mexico game, and it'll be after I get done with my work for the paper. So at some point Saturday uh, Saturday night, so make sure you follow me on Twitter and get an update on when I'm going to start that. And keep visiting Madison.com for all your Badgers football news. And if you haven't yet, please subscribe to the Red Zone Podcast on iTunes or Google Play. Thanks for listening.